The car skid, screeched, twisted, and tore off the ice-clad highway. I know I did not see it shooting up in the air. I was inside, in the back seat. But I felt it flying, and I swear I could see it. <coughs> Slowly, almost gracefully, the car soared through the air, tumbled like a whale out of water, and then silently sank into the snow, wheels up, still spinning. I can't die, was my first thought. Sonia, she's not even three. I wasn't scared. I didn't scream. I didn't move. In my mind, however, a lot of things happened. Time became gooey. It stalled. I did not come to the far north, five kilometers from the Arctic Circle, to die. I came for money. At the Konica oil field in the middle of snowy nowhere, translators made $100 a day. In one month, I made $3,000. Back home in St. Petersburg, I had my little girl, my daughter, Sonia. She stayed with a living nanny. My husband at the time was a heroin junkie. He did not bring any income. He took mine. My father was dying from brain cancer, so my mother was taking care of him and did not work. My grandmother was still around, but she was 80. She didn't work either. There was some money trickling in here and there from pension funds and relatives abroad, but it was never enough to cover the medical expenses for my father and living. $3,000 a month was enough for everyone to live on, including my daughter's nanny and her two daughters. She was a single mother. All those people, eight of them, depended on me. I could not abandon them. I could not die. I worked on rotation, 28 days shift without weekends, from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., but at night in my room, I was writing the next great novel of the 21st century. At 25, you always write the next great novel. I had to finish that novel. I couldn't die. And at 25, you don't really believe you can die. You know it, and yet you don't. Even if you have suicidal tendencies, or even if you saw people die. I have flirted with death all my life. I've contemplated the way to depart in style since I was six. The proverbial funeral room full of remorseful relatives, a puny coffin, my pale profile meets orchids, Edgar Allan Poe's style was one of my favorite fantasies. When I was 16, however, my mother's student jumped off a balcony because of a boy. She ended up not dying, but paralyzed and in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. My mother set me down in the kitchen then, poured me strong black tea, it smelled of bergamot and plum jam, and showed me her pinky. I still remember her finger, slender, and an almond-like nail. See this, she said. Now remember, not one man in the world is worth a piece of broken nail from your pinky. Not one. Understand? Drink tea. I understood. Jumping off the balcony lost its appeal forever. Each time I broke up with a guy, I just got high, drank lots of tea with plum jam, and went for a manicure. <laughs> My mother did not take into account that there were a lot of reasons to hate life beyond poor relationships. But somehow, logistics was always in the way. If you slit your veins open in the bathtub, someone will find you. Think more right. Unsightly. If you throw yourself underneath the steaming train, the train operator would have nightmares for the rest of his life. Anna Karenina was not considerate. <laughs> Jumping off the bridge, I never forgot the blue swollen body of the fisherman I saw in the village in the summer when I was six. It was not attractive. I had to look gorgeous in that coffin. My dreams of death were akin my dreams of true love. The death, like a true beloved, was supposed to ride on a white horse in a flowing gown, pale 
and smelling of orchids and carry me away, deadly and intact, into the shining spheres. The real death, just like the real love, did not stand up to expectations. My father was dying slowly, torturously. The scars on his wax yellow head from two surgeries turned from raspberry red to ivory. His hair fell off from chemo. The shared hospital rooms of the cancer ward smelled of sweat and excrements. I watched a few people dying. First, they stopped eating. At the end, hissing came from their throats. There was nothing glowing or flowing about their death. No orchids, no shining spheres, the heavy order of this too, too solid flesh, the burden of bones it was. Dying from overdosing was a bit more romantic. I overdosed on heroin two or three times, I can't remember. The times that I was in Push's homes were safe. They just drag you to the bathroom, shove your head underneath the cold water, slap your cheeks and scream, do not fucking die on my carpet. I saw it happening to others. Boy, I did it to others. Overdosing in the abandoned house on the cement floor was different, however. It almost solved my to be or not to be dilemma. I wasn't sure how they brought me back. Perhaps dropped some snow on my cheeks, lots of slapping, all I remember is the fuzzy amber slumber and the warm slow peace turning black like music fading off. Then my friend's twisted mouth, breathe, 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 and the lazy reluctance to breathe. That death did not feel real. Nothing felt real. All this flirting with death had happened before I had a child though. Since I had her, since got real. When the thoughts of death came, and they came even more often than before, there was a wall there, a wall that would never let me kill myself. Simply put, there was no one else to take care of her. She was mine, mine only. Her little glistening eyes, like beautiful dark blue pearly buttons, hair thin wrinkles on her wrists, her fierce frown, her piercing screams. She was born sick and rushed to a hospital. That hospital room did not smell of the decomposing flesh of the cancer ward. It smelled of babies and milk, but death was there too. There were three babies in the room. One was dying underneath a glass case. His head was enlarged like a giant balloon. He was only three weeks old, his mother abandoned him. He was dying alone. The other baby was a beautiful, bouncy, nine-month-old girl. She was healthy. She was in the hospital because her mother abandoned her too. The nurses did not want to give her away to an orphanage, so she was there smiling and cooing, and we all changed her diapers and fed her from a bottle. The third baby was mine. I did not want to abandon my baby. I had to stay alive. Strangely, all these thoughts and many, many more, the unfairness, the untimeliness of my death, the desire to see my father and mother again, the rational thoughts of the water bottles in the back of the car, the glasses on my nose, would all this glass break? They all fit into the seconds that the car was tumbling in midair. The time extended like a telescope. My memories, thoughts, and feelings filled it like transparent kaleidoscope pieces. They lingered in space. All was so crystal clear, crystalline, lucid. I understood life. I understood the universe. Despite of gazillion pieces and the complexity of the pattern, it was simple and linear. I had to live. Death would have to wait. I had a purpose. Raising my child, writing my novel. Raising my child, my novel, my child. The thought pulsed louder than my heartbeat. My child, my child, my child. Then the car landed in the snow. I was upside down. I knew I was alive. 
The silence was deafening. I wondered if the Scottish guys in the front seat were alive. The light was all dim blue. I touched my nose and saw bright red blood on my finger. My glasses scratched the bridge of my nose but didn't break. It is funny how the memory works. In patches, I remember the thirds during the moment the car was suspended in the air with surgical microscopic precision, even now, 20 years after. I don't remember which one of us spoke first. All three of us were alive. We all had bruises and scratches. Nothing was broken. Every bottle in the back of the car stayed whole. That's why we were there in the first place. We were delivering water to the field facilities office. I remember crawling out of the window in many layers of clothes and steel toe boots. It was not easy. I remember digging my way through the snow all the way to the surface. It was the snow that saved us. The snow piled at the Arctic Circle in March are six feet deep. The temperature is about minus 40 Fahrenheit. I don't remember feeling cold. Even though I know that we were freezing on the side of the road for three hours or so, the light got lilac hazy, it got dark around 4 p.m. The roads in this area were desolate, a few trucks a day, sometimes no traffic at all. The radio didn't work, we didn't have cell phones, it was 1993. I do not remember when the truck arrived or how they pulled the car from the snow and who did it. I do remember the dent in the roof in the place where my head used to be. I do not remember the ride back to the camp. I remember drinking whiskey with the Scottish guys. I do not remember their faces. I remember eating borscht, black bread with salt, apples, drinking hot black tea with a lot of jam. I remember spending a long sleepless night in the arms of a pretty boy, a translator from Arhangelsk. I hardly said a word with him before or after, but I remember his smell, cigarettes and bubble gum, and I still remember his violet eyes and a beautiful mouth. I don't remember his name. I just remember feeling his hot skin on mine, and I remember feeling alive, feverish and hungry for life that night, like I never did before. Now that I knew that death was real and now there waiting for me, I did not want to die. I had children to raise and novels to write.